As I said at the start of my programme yesterday, yesterday marked the start of the fourth month of Ukraine's counteroffensive. Supposedly, this offensive has a few more weeks to go until the autumn rains close in, until the mud season begins. There's been some claims that this is not strictly accurate, that further south in the areas around Militopol, the um, conditions, the earth, the soil becomes sandy, that we don't have the same kind of mud that we have in the black earth zone further to the north. That might, of course, be the case, though I have to say straight away that I myself find it difficult to believe that changes in the weather, heavy rain and all that are unlikely to have some impact on the fighting, whether they would, that would benefit the attackers or the defenders, of course, well, that's a completely different matter. But anyway, we are now into the fourth month of this offensive, and as I discussed yesterday in my programme yesterday, President Putin has said that the uh, offensive up to this point is a failure. And he made this point about it over the course of a press conference that he had in Sochi with the Turkish President, um, uh, 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 President Erdogan. And um, he said, these were, these were his exact words, as for the stalling counter-offensive, counter it is not stalling, it is a failed counter-offensive. At least, as of today, it looks exactly like that. Let's see how things unfold. I hope it will continue like this. So, in effect, what he's saying is that the counteroffensive is a failure. It appears to him that it is a failure. Uh, it's not stalled. It's not failed to advance. It is straightforwardly failing. Of course, we're in a dynamic situation. Anything might happen. War is an uncertain business, but for the moment, that is the situation. It has failed, and Putin hopes that it will remain that way. The last being unsurprising, given that obviously he is the president of Russia, so he would not want to see an offensive succeed against Russia. So that was what Vladimir Putin said. Now, the Russian Defence Minister, Sergei Shoigu, has also been speaking and he's had more to say about the condition of the offensive. He's spoken in a um, vid video conference with the leaders of the Russian Defence Ministry and over the course of it he's given his own uh, account of the state of things in the offensive. And I will read out what he says. This time he's made fewer comments than on other occasions, but this is what he said. He said about the special military operation, the Russian armed forces continue active actions along the entire line of contact. The Kiev regime, despite heavy losses, has been trying for the third month to wage the so-called counteroffensive. In none of these areas did the Ukrainian military achieve their objectives. The Ukrainian leadership is desperately trying to demonstrate to its Western handlers at least some successive offensive actions in order to further receive military and economic support, which only prolongs the conflict. The most tense situation was in the Zaporozhye direction. The enemy has brought into the battle brigades from its strategic reserves, whose personnel have been trained under military uh, whose personnel have been trained under Western instructors. Thanks to the selfless actions of servicemen of the 810th Brigade and of the 177th Marine Regiment, the 56th Airborne Assault Regiment and the 71st Motorized R Rifle Regiment, as well as units of the 76th Airborne Assault Division of the Russian Armed Forces, significant damage has been inflicted on Ukrainian units. Acting de decisively in Kupiansk and Kremenayar directions, Russian troops 
liberated Novosiolovskoye, this is a village that I've talked about some time ago, significantly improving the situation along the front line. And then he goes on to say, in further comments, since the beginning of the so-called offensive, the enemy losses were 66,000 men and 7,600 pieces of equipment. And he also complains that in attempts to cover up the failure of the offensive, Ukrainian soldiers are attacking civilian objects and presenting these attacks as military victories. As a result of competent actions of Russian combat units, the 159 HIMARS missiles, over 1,000 unmanned aerial vehicles and 13 cruise missiles were shot down last month and of course he means by that in august well in other words he's increased the total number of ukrainian casualties to 66,000 uh, since the start of the offensive i'm not going to try to second guess these figures i'm not able to i have no means of doing so i would say again that he's talking about ukrainian losses he seems to be giving a global number for ukrainian losses so presumably this figure of 66000 includes both dead and wounded now that may be an overstatement of the facts i don't know but there have been increasing admissions in the west that ukraine is indeed suffering extremely heavy casualties and has been doing so throughout the entire period of this offensive. There's been a long article in the London Times talking about the heavy losses that the 47th Mechanised Brigade, that was the one that was equipped with the Bradley Infantry Fighting Vehicles and the Leopard 2 tanks, and which apparently was trained principally in Germany. Anyway, the heavy losses that this particular brigade has suffered, we're told that its losses were in four figures. And there's been article, rather a commentary on the BBC also, um, talking about the very heavy losses that Ukraine has suffered. It speaks, it discusses situations in Ukrainian cemeteries among mortuary web um, um, workers and such things. Incidentally, on that last topic, I've had a number of people comment to me that apparently the cemetery in the western city of Lviv in Ukraine has increased its size to encompass 1,500 graves. Now, the important thing to say about Lviv is that, like other big cities in Ukraine up to this point, Lviv, uh, Kiev, of course, first and foremost, it seems that recruitment in Ukraine has been lightest amongst young people, young men in these big cities. The heaviest weight of mobilization up to this point has happened in the small villages and towns across Ukraine. This is, by the way, typical in most armies. It's certainly true in the Russian army. I can say that it's also largely true in the British army as well. And of course, there, the burden of loss and the increase in the size of cemeteries and such things, well, that, of course, is proportionately greater. But even in a place like Viv, there's been a significant size, increase in the size of the cemetery there, or so it seems. Anyway, that's what I wanted to say about this. Now, what is then the current state of the offensive as of today, the Ukraine's offensive as of today? There's been a very convoluted article in the Daily Telegraph, which my colleague and friend, Alex Christoforou, and I recently discussed discuss in a program on the Duran, which will no doubt be appearing soon. But in that article in the Daily Telegraph, um, there was talk about Ukraine having uh, um, reached or breached the final line of Russian defences. And it, it was another example of this 
issue of where the Russian defence lines are being a constantly changing topic, depending on who's discussing this. Because when you actually go to the article itself, it turns out that the final line of Russian defence is we're not talking here about the massive layered defences that the Russians have created reaching down south towards Topmak and beyond these big fortified barriers with their trenches and their dragon streets and their minefields and all of that. Rather, we're talking about a defence line around Verbovoye, this village in the uh, area um, where Ukraine has been fighting and pushing hard ever since the offensive began in June. And I have to say this, I'm going to say this straightforwardly, the article, it seems to me, is intended through its headline to convey an impression of a major Ukrainian breakthrough, as if the entire Russian defence system in southern Ukraine, in, well, in the territory that Ukraine would call southern Ukraine, in Zaporozhye region, has collapsed, and that the final line of defence has been breached, whereas we're still, in fact, talking about fighting in the same areas, as I said, where Ukraine has been trying to make its push, trying to achieve its breaks, breakthrough ever since it began its offensive on the 4th of June. And on that topic, I should say that yesterday seems to have been a relatively quiet day in this area, which is the northern lines in Zaporozhye region. The report suggested that there were no big Ukrainian attacks around Rabotino and in Verobovoye. Interestingly, by the way, this Daily, Te Daily Telegraph article talks about fighting taking place near Rabotino, which, of course, according to the Daily Telegraph, has actually been captured by Ukraine. As was said many times, the Russians dispute this. But anyway, the fact is that yesterday was a relatively quiet day, but today it seems is different. Today, Ukraine is launching more in attacks, more intense attacks, along the southern front lines, towards Arabotino itself, towards Verobovoye. It's too early for me to provide any update as to the state of these attacks. The only information I'm getting is that very heavy fighting is taking place. And in one area, Ukraine has been pushed back, but I'm not entirely sure where this area exactly is. So there's heavy fighting going on again. And at the moment, at least as of the time of making of this programme, talk of this Ukrainian breakthrough, even at the first big defensive line, is premature. And to reiterate again, the only area where it can be said that Ukraine has approached this defence line is the area around Verobovoye, this village, as I said, to the east of Rabotino, on the high ground. And, of course, there's been reports that Ukrainian infantry have been trying to move on Ukra uh, Verobovoye, advancing uphill um, through the initial fortifications of the spur of the Surovikin line, which is located in this area, but certainly not achieving any breakthrough, certainly up to the point when this program is made. And to reiterate again, we're only talking about the first line of the Surovikin line. There are many others, at least two others, two other great barriers beyond it. And I should say that I read a number of analyses that took strong issue with the comments that were made by General Tarnavsky, the Ukrainian general who was interviewed by The Guardian um, some days ago. He said that the most, the strongest Russian defences were the first defences. It wasn't clear whether he was talking about the Surovikin line or the areas, the, the 
forward defences around places like Robotino. I think he was being deliberately vague about all of this. But anyway, um, Tarnavsky was saying that this is where the strongest defences are. There's been a fair amount of commentary pointing out that, in fact, the strongest defences are actually the second line of the Surovikin line, not the area around Rabotino, which is beyond the Surovikin line, not the first line of the Surovikin line, but actually the second. That is the strongest defence. That's the strongest line of defence um, as conceived by the Russians, by General Romanchuk, who perhaps more than General Surovikin is the true architect and um, so begetter of this enormous defence line. He is apparently the person who is the expert on creating defence lines in the Russian military, and apparently he largely supervised the construction of this one. Anyway, I'm not an expert on military fortifications, or indeed on any matters military, <laughs> except to the extent that I've learned things over the course of this year and a half, over the course of this year, of this war. So I'm not going to discuss that further. But anyway, that's what I wanted to say. So there is another big Ukrainian attack underway. As I said, it will be some hours before we get a sense of what's happened. I will have to discuss that in my next programme, which will be published, I presume, tomorrow. Anyway, that's, that's where we are on the southern front lines. Now, President Zelensky himself has been busy. He's actually travelled and met troops on the front lines. And interestingly, he's gone not to the southern front lines, at least not so far. He might, I suppose, go there later. But his place of visit has been the area around Bakhmut. He has been talking, visiting the troops there. And it's perhaps worth pointing out that by going to the area around Bakhmut, he seems to be, metaphorically speaking, stuck, sticking up two fingers at the West, because, of course, the West is constantly telling Ukraine, end this offensive in Bakhmut, Withdraw all your troops there, redeploy them to the south, reinforce your offensive in the south. Bakhmut isn't that important. You've spent, you've lost too many men defending it. You're losing too many men trying to recapture it. Concentrate your men elsewhere and let Bakhmut go. Well, Zelensky remains, it seems, fully committed to the Battle of Bakhmut. And the fact that he's gone there seems to be intended to tell both the soldiers, the Ukrainian soldiers, in and around, well, not in, but attacking towards Bakhmut and the Western leaders, that he's not going to pay any attention to their advice. As far as he's concerned, Bakhmut remains as important as always. What exactly is the reason for Zelensky's focus on Bakhmut, I'm not clear. I'm not clear why General Sirsky is so focused on Bakhmut. Maybe it's partly a case now of people like Zelensky and Sirsky, conscious of their acute over-dependence on the West, taking steps to try to assert such independence as they have by emphasizing an attack, a Ukrainian attack, in a direction different from the one that the Western powers would like Ukraine to follow. And anyway, that does seem to be the situation. He's presumably um, gone to this area specifically with the intention of giving the impression of support for this attack on Bakhmut and 
that this is in fact the main area that he remains most interested in. And in fact, there have been numerous reports of heavy Ukrainian attacks in the Bakhmut area over the last couple of hours of a further attack towards Klesheevka, of the Ukrainians managing to reach Klesheevka and, as they've done before, capturing a few houses on the western outskirts of Klesheevka. Russian reports of the Ukrainians being pushed back, of Russian advances um, elsewhere in this part of the front line near Kordyumovka. But anyway, there's been intense fighting in this particular area of the front lines, and it seems that the fighting continues and it remains very intense. And despite all the pressure from the West, Ukraine is not giving up its attacks around Bakhmut. The Russians, for their part, are continuing to talk up the prospects of their advance towards Kupiansk. You saw that in my in what Shoigu said, that the Russians have improved their positions there. And in fact, even as I've been making this program, there are some reports that the Russians have been able to push the Ukrainians back in the village of Petropavlovka, which is to the east of Kupiansk, and which is a village that the Russians need to capture before they attack Kupiansk itself. So, there we go. That's overall the situation on the battlefronts. Um, I should say that as of this time, precisely as during the period of time when um, this program was underway, the Russian Defense Ministry has published another bulletin, and it talks about so, the course of the fighting. And it says, in the Zaporozhye direction, units of the Russian grouping of troops, aviation, artillery, uh, and heavy flamethrower systems have repelled two attacks by the 47th Mechanized Brigade of the Ukrainian army close to Rabotino. Enemy losses were up to 170 Ukrainian servicemen, two tanks, three armored fighting vehicles, four motor vehicles, three U.S. manufactured M777 artillery systems, one M119 howitzer, one German manufactured Panzer Halbitzer 2000 self-propelled artillery system, one British manufactured FH-70 gun, and one D-20 and one D-30 Soviet-era howitzers. So the Russian Defense Ministry in this bulletin is speaking about the latest Ukrainian attack in this area having been repelled, but of course it's still a sketchy report and we'll no doubt be getting more information later. Anyway, that's, I think, all I can usefully say about the situation in the front lines. And certainly it's the case that there's been more um, drone and other types of attacks taking place on both sides. The Russians claim to have shot down more drones. I'm sort of getting the sense that the air war, the drone and missile war, for the moment has died down a little. Perhaps both sides are busy restocking their drone and missile fleets. The Russians certainly look like there are lots of reports that they're building up their stock of cruise missiles and no doubt of drones as well in preparation for whatever offensive they might be planning to launch at some point over the next few weeks. Anyway, that's, I think, all I can usefully say about the state of the war at the moment. Now, diplomacy, by contrast, continues to be very active. And we've had this lengthy meeting between President Erdogan and Putin in Sochi. I've discussed this previously. I've said that it seems as if when you actually go past the commentaries, the discussions, the, the, the published texts, of the discussions. What is happening is that the Russians 
are telling Erdogan that if he wants to put the relationship between Russia and Turkey on a long-term, secure and stable basis, then, then Turkey needs to start thinking about joining the BRICS. The point being the Turkey, a country with very high inflation, an extremely unstable currency, uh, and an eccentric monetary policy, um, that it um, is not a country with which Russia can easily trade in terms of national currencies. And that really Turkey needs, therefore, to be part of the BRICS system with these new accounting systems that are being created to facilitate trade between the BRICS countries in order for the trade between Russia and Turkey to be placed on a fully stable, long-term basis. And as I discussed also in my previous programme, there's reports that the Chinese embassy in Ankara has been telling the Turkish government, President Erdogan specifically, that his country should consider an applying to join the BRICS. And there was a report yesterday whose accuracy I am completely unable to vouch for, that um, Turkey, for its part, has made inquiries of Iran, which of course is now joining the BRICS, about how it can be done and how it will work for Iran and how it might work for Turkey. Now, I want to stress this is a very unconfirmed report. I'm not sure that it's true. I'm not sure that the position of Turkey and of Iran, that the positions of these two countries are analogous. Iran is outside, obviously, the Western alliance system. It is in an adversarial relationship with the United States and the West and has been so ever since the Iranian Revolution of 1979. Whereas, of course, Turkey, nominally at least, remains a part of the West. It is a member of NATO, of the NATO Alliance and Western Military Bloc, so that for Turkey to join the BRICS, or even to apply to do so, would be a very different thing indeed than for, uh, for a country like Iran to do so. But anyway, for what it's worth, that report is out there. And I would be very surprised indeed if Erdogan didn't at least consider the possibility, even though perhaps he's not the man to carry it forward. Anyway, that's one thing that's been going on. It was a big meeting between Erdogan and Putin. Lots of commentary now in the Russian media about Putin's comments about the grain deal, that he basically didn't give an inch on it. He continued to insist that the other side, Ukraine and the Western powers, must first fulfil all their promises in connection with the grain deal, for the grain deal to be reactivated. And the interesting thing was that over the course of their joint press conference, President Erdogan himself didn't actually disagree. In fact, he even asked for Ukraine to soften its position. Now, most Russian commentators and myself are taking these words, these comments of Putin's and these statements in the press conference and indeed the very measured words from Erdogan as the clearest possible sign that the Grain Deal is in effect dead and permanently so, that there is no realistic possibility of it ever being revived, that Putin is making demands of the Western powers and of Ukraine, which the Russians now realize neither Ukraine nor the Western powers will ever fulfill, and that this is an elegant way of shifting the blame for, what's, for the collapse of the grain deal 
onto Ukraine and the Western powers, an elegant but perhaps some would also say a true way of shifting the blame back onto those countries, whilst at the same time signalling that the grain deal is now well and truly ended, it is not going to be revived, it is now an event from the past. And perhaps over and above the Russian attacks on Ukraine's Black Sea ports, including the port of Reni, which is close to Romania on the Black Sea. There's also been Russian bombing attacks on Snake Island. Remember Snake Island? Small place, not far from Odessa. Russia captured it early in the war, then abandoned it when the Ukrainians installed long-range artillery on the coast lines, uh, long-range Caesar howitzers that meant that Ukraine could shell Russian positions on Snake Island. Then as part of the grain deal, the Russians implicitly, as it now has been confirmed, allowed the Ukrainians to reoccupy Snake, Snake Island. Now the Russians are attacking Ukrainian positions on Snake Island. I think that this is being principally done now as a further way of saying that the grain deal is once and forever and truly ended. Now, Ukraine did make some attempts to enlist Romania into the arguments over the attacks on the Black Sea ports. Reni is indeed located very close to Romania. The U Romanian government has acted quickly to make it clear that no millimeter of Ukra Romanian territory has been struck by any Russian missile and that there is no apprehension in Bucharest that that will happen. And I have to say this rather strong statements from Romania um, were interesting in themselves and did seem to me to mirror certain comments made by the Estonian authorities following the Ukrainian drone attack on the Russian airbase of Pskov, where those two Ilyushin 76 transport aircraft were destroyed by Ukrainian drones. Now, Ukraine's uh, intelligence chief, Kirill Budanov, has strongly hinted that this drone attack on the airbase of Pskov was carried out by saboteurs infiltrated into Russia close to the airbase itself. Obviously, he wasn't saying whether these were Ukrainians or whether they were Russian dissidents or anything of that kind. I suspect that the Russians, at least, are taking these comments by Budanov very seriously, and there's presumably a manhunt underway. But the most interesting thing is that in the days after the Pskov attack, senior Estonian military officials came out and said that the attack on Pskov was senseless, that the, that the aircraft at this base were playing no role at all in the conflict in Ukraine. And it became fairly clear that Estonia was very, very unhappy with this attack altogether. I wonder, <laughs> this is just a guess, and I don't want to push it too far, I wonder whether the Estonians are worried that the Ukrainian sabotage group that launched this strike on the airbase in Pskov, whether the Estonians aren't worried that it entered Russia, from U Estonian territory. It's not difficult, by the way. I know, I have actual acquaintances who tell me that it's now a fairly well-established shuttle trip. If you want to travel to Russia, a lot of people go to Estonia and take the coach from Estonia to St. Petersburg, for example. And that this is, you know, Estonia has started to fulfill something of the 
position of a transit place for people who want to travel from the west to northern Russia. Anyway, that I want to stress is a guess. It may be completely wrong. It may be that the Ukrainian saboteurs, if they even exist, didn't come through Estonia at all, that they came into Russia in some completely different way. Or it could be, and this is a possibility, one must acknowledge that they are disaffected Russians. There are people in Russia, Russians who support Ukraine in this conflict and who are deeply and bitterly opposed to the Putin government. They may not be particularly many in number in percentage terms, but they certainly exist. Anyway, regardless of that, these Estonian comments were made, and it does make me wonder whether perhaps putting aside the question of whether saboteurs entered Russia from Estonian territory, it does seem to me that the Estonians were not happy about military strikes on a Russian airbase so close to Estonia itself, with perhaps questions and suspicions on the Russian side directed towards Estonia. And these rather strong comments about Estonia were, in effect, from Estonia, were perhaps Estonia signalling to Ukraine, don't do this again. And the rather sharp comments made from Romania perhaps tell the same story that neither of these countries is particularly happy to be involved directly by Ukraine in this conflict and that both the Estonian and Romanian governments are making that fact clear. Well, anyway, I just mentioned this. I'm not entirely sure what's going on, but anyway, there's been some comments about that. But coming back to the diplomacy, there's also now a very intriguing story which originated in the New York Times. And this is about a supposed visit by no less a person than Kim Jong-un, the leader of North Korea to Russia, where he's going to meet, apparently, President Putin himself. Now, the Russians have not confirmed that this visit is taking place, and as far as I know, there's been no word about it from the North Koreans either. However, Peskov, Putin's spokesman, when asked about it, refused to confirm that such a visit had been agreed, but neither did he deny that it might happen. And I do wonder a little about how the New York Times got wind of this story, where they provided this information by US intelligence. How did US intelligence find out about these discussions between the Russians and the North Koreans, two relatively secretive governments. Anyway, that's um, an interesting question, and one to which I obviously have no answer. But is it possible that Kim Jong-un is indeed going to head to Russia? Some reports suggest that he's going to meet Putin in Vladivostok, in Russia's Far East. Others are saying that he's going to travel on his armoured train all the way to Moscow and have a summit meeting with Putin in Moscow. Is this all possible? Well, I would say it is possible. And of course, there's a huge amount of speculation that the purpose of Kim Jong-un's visit is to seal a military relationship, that the North Koreans will be supplying shells 152 millimeter shells to the Russians out of their apparently gigantic stockpile of shells. Of course, North Korea also has a very large munitions industry, so it could presumably produce more shells for the Russian military. And that the Russians, in return, have promised, are offering to give Ukraine 
high technology satellites and satellite um, technology and North Korea is trying to establish its own satellite array but you know the Russians might be prepared to provide some technological help with that and of course they could also provide North Korea with technological assistance in lots of other areas as well. Now, as I said, all of this is interesting, and I'm not sure exactly what is going on. I'm not sure that anything particular is going on. But let me reiterate again, if it happens, if there is indeed going to be a summit meeting between Russia and North Korea, if Russian-North Korean relations are restored, not just in an economic and political respect, but even in a military one, then it is a further example of the blowback that is now developing as a result of the US's economic war against the Russians. Um, with the Russians, now I believe one of the most sanctioned countries in the world, perhaps even the most heavily sanctioned country in the world, they have no incentive, no reason any longer not to develop closer relations with their old friends in North Korea. And of course, to the extent that doing so provides them with leverage over the Americans and, by the way, the South Koreans and potentially even the Japanese, they have a positive incentive to do it. And, of course, in the case of South Korea, we can see again the attraction. Um, previous South Korean governments have maintained very friendly relations with Russia, and the Russians went out of their way to develop friendly relations with South Korea. There were cases where Russia and South Korea actually collaborated in developing weapon systems. So the S-350 anti-aircraft missile system that the Russians are now fielding on the battlefields and which apparently uses AI technology was originally developed in collaboration with the South Koreans, though it seems the South Koreans and the Russians eventually went their own separate ways in terms of development of what turned out in the end to be different though connected systems. So it does seem as if Russia made a big effort to develop a good relationship with South Korea, obviously a much richer far more economically developed country than North Korea. And for the South Koreans, this was also an important, potentially an important economic and strategic relationship. Not only is Russia this huge country to the north, potential counterbalance against Russia, the South Koreans would not want, sorry, against China, South Koreans would not want Russia and China moving too close with each other. There was an incentive to try and keep some kind of distance between these two powers. It's also, of course, the most resource-rich country in the world. There was talk about Russia supplying South Korea with gas, providing South Korea with important natural resources. It did look as if this would be a complementary and successful relationship. And I can remember just a few years ago now, a visit by the Japanese Prime Minister, as he then was, Shinzo Abe, and the South Korean president of that time. I'm afraid I can't remember this person's name, but I can remember them meeting in a very friendly encounter in Sochi, discussing potential future economic development between the Russians, the, the Japanese, and the South Koreans. And then, of course, a few months ago, word came out that South Korea 
We're supplying 155 millimeter shells to the United States. Supposedly, it was lending shells to the United States. The word was that most of these shells would end up in Ukraine, which I strongly suspect has indeed been the case. The Russians were displeased. Whether the Russians are responding by importing shells from North Korea, I have absolutely no idea. But we see that the Russians are now telling the South Koreans, look, if you want to get close to the Ukrainians, that's your business. But if so, don't expect us to treat you as a friendly country anymore. And we're going to get closer in response to your adversary in the north. And that, it seems to me, is what is happening. So, we see how the Biden administration's attempts to create lines to force countries that are close to the United States into supporting this adventure in Ukraine is actually recreating old blocks, Russia and China are getting closer, North Korea and Russia are getting closer, North Korea and China might eventually get closer as well. The Russian ambassador in North Korea has floated the possibility of joint military exercises. This has now been reported in the media as an actual proposal from the Russians to hold joint military exercises between North Korea, Russia and China. The ambassador actually was careful to say that it was just his own opinion that this should happen. He made it clear that this was not, in fact, policy so far. But anyway, <laughs> if that does indeed happen, if we're going to see a alliance between Russia, China and North Korea emerge in North East Asia, in response to the alliance that the United States has been trying to build between itself and Japan and South Korea, if another source of tension in the world is created, if all the attempts to create detente on the Korean Peninsula come to an end, if the North Korean economy is stabilised fully and returns to growth, Apparently, it was growing quite strongly just a few years ago. And if that means leaves Kim Jong-un in a stronger position where he not only has nuclear weapons, which he does, but also a technologically developing conventional military benefiting from Russian technology and a stronger economy, well, it is the Biden administration itself which have would have brought that about. And if, looking even further towards even more dark prospects, if the Chinese, if the Japanese and the South Koreans respond to this by developing nuclear weapons of their own, and in South Korea there has apparently been some discussion of this, then, of course, the nuclear non-proliferation regime will have finally and perhaps irretrievably collapsed, and that will not be a good outcome for anybody, but certainly not a good outcome for the United States. And I would add that a nuclear-powered South Korea and potentially a nuclear-powered Japan might also feel that having obtained the purported security that nuclear weapons provide these two countries might actually, in that case, start to pursue foreign policies more independent of and more at variance with, that of, with those of the United States. So that's looking perhaps further forward than it is safe to do at this time. Anyway, we will see. I think this is an important thing to keep a, keep a look out for. The United States is said to be alarmed by the rapprochement between North Korea and Russia. 
it is right to be alarmed. I don't see that this is good for the United States in any conceivable way. But if it is happening, then it is entirely a product of US policies. And, of course, in the meantime, and coming back to that other subject, other topic, which is the Russian economy, one that floats up <laughs> repeatedly, I should just make a few quick observations as I um, anticipated the period of brief ruble strength that followed Nabulina's right increase in interest rates um, earlier in August has uh, worn thin. The ruble has been softening again and is now apparently trading at around 97 rubles to the dollar. I continue to believe that later in the year, as growth eases off in Russia um, and as monetary and fiscal policy starts to tighten, and as Russian revenues from energy sales begins to grow, we will start to see the ruble strengthen again. But to repeat a point I have made many times, for the Russians, the international trading weight of the ruble against the dollar, the euro, pound sterling, is perhaps no longer the great issue that it was 10 or so years ago when the Russians borrowed heavily in Western currencies, when their financial system was heavily integrated into the West, when their imports of many spare parts and consumer products came directly from the West. Russia's remaining con concern is not the international trading weight of the ruble. Rather, it is domestic inflation. And though that has been rising over the last few weeks, and the Russian finance minister, Anton Siluanov, has even said that it might hit 6% by the end of the year, not far off, by the way, what we're seeing in Germany and in elsewhere in Europe. Nonetheless, I think the Russians feel that overall they have the inflation situation under control, and I suspect that there remains now a strong possibility that later this month the Russian Central Bank will increase interest rates again. And I think one of the reasons it might do so is because the one thing that the interest rate increase in August for the moment is not doing is slowing down the Russian economy. Now, in the second quarter of this year, the Russian re economy began a massive re rebound. I think people perhaps underestimate the extent to which that has happened. But it's now clear that Russian savings almost certainly grew, as they did in most of the world during the period of the pandemic. Russia did experience lockdowns, though not as intense as those in some Western countries, but arguably there was a period when Russians were saving because of lockdowns in their own country. And of course, last year, with the sanctions imposed, the incentive to save increased even more. Well, in the second quarter, especially as the Russian authorities last year and in the first part of this year, tried to get Russian consumers to start shopping and buying again, they got arguably more than they bargained for. And in the second quarter, Russian consumers hit, them, hit the services sector and it started to boom. And there's been heavy upward pressure on sales. And of course, this has run into supply constraints and this has led to a degree of overheating. Now, going forward, we have had some PMI figures from Russia. And PMI tells us about the likely progress of the economy in the next few months. And manufacturing PMI, 
And it's important to say that year-on-year -year growth in the second quarter this year was well over 10%. It's manufacturing growth, admittedly from a low base last year. But certainly there's been a big manufacturing surge, only, which is only partly accounted for, by the way, by the increases in military spending. But anyway, manufacturing PMI has actually risen, apparently from 52.4 to 52.7. Remember, in PMI surveys, anything below 50 points to contraction, anything above 50 points to expansion. So it seems as if Russian manufacturers are anticipating further expansion. Investment is high, output is high, and they expect that growth in their sector will continue. But the service PMI has come in higher still, at around 57. And that suggests that Russian consumers are brushing off, for the moment, the higher interest rates and are continuing to spend. Now, at some point, all of this is going to start to cool down. As I said, the Russian central bank looks like it's uh, tightening monetary policy. We're probably going to see more increases in interest rates within the next few weeks. It's likely that the Russian finance ministry, well, in fact, the Russian finance ministry, is seeking to move the budget into surplus in the second half of this year. So spending, government spending, will probably fall. But anyway, until that happens, the economy continues to grow strongly. And Finance Minister Siluanov is now saying that he is expecting overall growth this year to be around 2.5%. Now, that sounds good. That's GDP growth. But as I said, it, it is resulting in an uptick in inflation. The central bank, the Russian central bank, is very keen to get inflation down. And I suspect that they will continue to push interest rates up as the finance ministry tries to balance the budget, which, by the way, I should say the budget deficit is at less than 2% of GDP at the moment. But anyway, they will try to balance the budget or at least push the budget into surplus. So as monetary and fiscal policy tighten, we will probably see we will probably see um, growth fall and <laughs> inflation fall also. And all of this taken together with the increases in e energy prices will mean that imports will start to ease off and export revenue will Im improve. And at that point, the ruble will begin to strengthen again. So anyway, that's the overall situation. Valentina Matveyenko, who is, as I understand it, the speaker of the upper house of the Russian parliament and is an important personality within the Russian power structure and a member of Russia's Security Council, has said that the Russian economy has learned to roll with the punches and has been doing so now for several years. And we see that it's achieving precisely this. If Russia does indeed achieve 2.5% growth this year, then the economy will come out bigger than it was in 2021. And the entire contraction that took place last year after the sanctions were imposed will have been extinguished. <laughs> From that point on, I expect that with all of these adjustments in the economy, tightening monetary and fiscal policies, improving 
current account position, we'll see inflation fall and growth fall and things will return to something more like normal and we will be back to the situation of steady incremental growth and diversification which Russia was the trajectory Russia was on before the particular the current crisis began now I appreciate there are other people who push back who take different views um, I've read all sorts of overheated commentaries about this very topic in other you know in, in other places all I would say is that I've been discussing Russian economy for the better part of a decade perhaps even longer and I would say that on in general my <laughs> assessments of it have been significantly more close to what eventually happens than those who take contrarian views. Anyway, there we go. That's one situation. Now, I will say, and since I'm embarking on the topic of economies, that I've been looking at some of the situations in other economies, generally, particularly in the Western economies. And over the last few months, as the British economy stagnates and as the European economy stagnates, apparently the Eurozone is going to eke out growth of around 0.6% this year overall. And that, of course, masks a significant decline in its manufacturing hub, which is, of course, Germany. And apparently there's also contraction underway in the Netherlands also and perhaps also in Sweden. But anyway, even as the Eurozone economy grows, um, people in Europe, especially in Britain, have been talking up the supposed strength of the US economy. And I've actually looked at growth figures in the United States this year, and apparently the prediction is that the forecast is that GDP growth in the United States is going to be 1.8%. Now, that is growth, if it is real growth. Of course, if you're spending vast sums of money, it might not be quite as substantial as some people suppose. But And I've seen some suggestions that uh, expansion in the United States in terms of industrial and manufacturing is not actually as impressive as some people believe. But anyway, even if we assume that, you know, 1.8% growth is real growth, which I know some people would push back against, um, it's still 1.8% growth. I mean, it still falls well short of a boom. And given that the total population within the United States has been growing, I'm not able to see how this is the great economic success story that some people are talking about. There's been a, a lot of discussion about China, and I've had programs recently with Jeffrey Sachs about how the Chinese economy is slowing. And, you know, all of this, I'm not in any way disputing any of this. We're probably going to be revisiting <coughs> this very same topic <coughs> of the state of the Chinese economy soon. And no doubt there are imbalances in China. No doubt there's a debt issue within the um, real estate sector. There's all those sorts of problems. But nonetheless... It seems to me that the Chinese economy is, continues to, to grow, even if its growth is not as colossal as it once was. But if it manages growth of 4 to 5%, some people think it'll be more than that this year, then it's continuing to grow significantly more strongly than the United States is. Just, just saying. And all of this brings me now to perhaps the last point, which is that I understand 
that Huawei, this company that the United States basically sought to sanction out of existence, it basically drove it out of the European markets and, of course, the North American market. It arrested or caused in Canada the arrest of its chief financial officer. It, it in effect, destroyed Huawei's position in the West. Well, this company has apparently now produced a smartphone with, well, I always get the power of the uh, microchip. I always get it wrong, but apparently it comes at seven, whatever. And apparently that is close to or similar to or identical to some of the most advanced microchips produced in South Korea and Taiwan. And this after the United States has been working overtime to try to block chip sales to China. And apparently some people, according to Bloomberg, have examined this smartphone and sure enough, it seems that this advanced chip is indeed of Chinese manufacture. It's a Chinese designed and manufactured chip. By the way, on that point, and you know, I'm not saying this is the case, but I do remember that when the sanctions were imposed on Huawei, there were reports that Huawei was looking to the um, Russian universities to work with them on developing the necessary um, systems to duplicate um, Taiwanese development of these chips. Apparently they were looking to capitalize on the mathematical skills in Russia. I'm not saying that this has anything to do with the production of this chip. But if Huawei is still working in Russia in that conceivable way, it is likely that the Russians will be able to gain very soon access to these chips as well if they need them. And by the way, a couple of weeks ago, I read that the Russians are working on setting up their own production lines for high-end chips as well, and that one of the um, institutes connected with the Russian Academy of Sciences has actually produced a pilot of the technology and equipment to start producing these chips. Again, I'm not able to discuss this in any expert way, but that's what I've heard. Well, putting all that aside, and I don't want to get into too many speculations, Assuming that this Bloomberg story is true, and assuming that this smartphone really does do all the people say and the reports about that are extensive, then it seems to me that we already see the utter futility of this assumption behind the American technology blockade of China that the United States is somehow in a position to control technological growth and development in its rival powers. The Chinese have just developed, apparently, a high-end chip comparable to the best that Taiwan can produce. And they're not only produced a chip like that, they're actually already installing it in their latest generations of smartphones. And all of this comes, even as reports trickle in, as I make this programme, that a British Challenger 2 tank has been destroyed on the battlefields of Ukraine. I've been looking, even as I've been making this programme, at pictures of what is said to be a British Challenger 2. I'm not able to confirm that, these pictures. I don't have the vision to do this, but I understand that Forbes has come out and said that this is in fact a real picture and that this is a real Challenger 2 and that it has actually been destroyed 
on the Ukrainian battlefields by the Russians. Well, if so, then here's another example of vaunted Western technology. I remember reading pieces in the Daily Telegraph, especially telling us how superior these British tanks were to the best tanks that the Russians had. Anyway, here we see another example that technology is not quite the giant game changer and advantage, either in economic or military terms, that people in the West believe it to be. I'm going to finish by one general observation, which is that whatever might have been the case once, in say the 1940s or 1950s or perhaps even later than that during various periods of the Cold War. Today, humanity essentially operates within a single technological universe. Something that can be built, made and designed in one part of the globe can be produced, designed and made in another part. It is simply impossible to control, to restrict technology in the way that the United States apparently thinks technology can be restricted. Doing so will create bumps on the road. It will slow things down in countries like China and Russia. But with China producing many more STEM graduates than the United States, with Russia producing as many STEM graduates as the United States, with every reason to think that these graduates that the Chinese and the Russians are producing are at least of comparable quality to those in the United States, with laboratories and resources, well, abundant in these countries. Inevitably, what will happen is that every attempt to create restrictions is simply going to provide, well, perhaps an initial setback for these countries, but also an opportunity to develop high-end products of their own. Friedrich Paul Nietzsche, the German philosopher, is supposed to have said that that which does not break you makes you stronger, and in attempting to restrict high technology. That is exactly what the United States is doing to its rivals. Well, that's me for today. Tomorrow, no doubt, I'll be able to tell you more about whether or not this Challenger 2 has indeed been destroyed. <laughs> and we'll have more confirmation or refutation of that later. We'll also see what the effect of these further Ukrainian attacks is on the Zaporozhye front lines. Perhaps we might even learn whether Kim Jong-un is indeed traveling to Russia. But anyway, this is me for the day. More from me soon. And let me repeat again, you can find all our programs on our various platforms. Uh, Locals and Rumble, perhaps, are you know places you should particularly look at. We're definitely going to be re-engaging significantly with X, the former Twitter. So look out for that. And just to remind you again, you can support our work via Patreon and Subscribestar. Links under this video. You can go to our shop and buy yourself the amazing things that you will find there. Our magic mugs, our hats, our hoodies, our t-shirts, our sweatshirts, all those great things. And last but not least... If you like this video, please remember to tick the like button and to check your subscription to this channel. That's me for today. Have a very good day and more from me soon.